Hi, I'm Pastor Bill Vigio of Meet of the Word Ministries, and you are watching our program, Let Us Go On. Now, I've gotten some mail and a couple phone calls in regards to where am I preaching and teaching. And again, I've got the TV program, radio program, but uh, recently I just preached a sermon in Smithfield, and I really want to work with this church. It's, it's very local, so if you're listening to this local, it's Pastor Lawrence Pounds. It's Family Worship Church at 1904 Landon Lang Langdon Avenue in Smithfield. I want to encourage you to go there and support it. You'll possibly see me every once in a while that not only preaching there but maybe may visiting as well. So if you want to get to know me more on a personal level, certainly attend that particular church. Again, uh, the Family Worship Church, 1904 Langdon Avenue in Smithfield. Now, I started last week a teaching series on the book of James, and the one, New Testament book of James, and I want to talk to you a little bit further. Now, last week, I, again, I want to look at this particular book, this New Testament writing, one of the earliest New Testament uh, uh, teachings or writings um, of all time in the New Testament after the book of Acts and those things, and I wanted to... Uh, take a look at it and examine it line upon line. But last week I had to make an, a very important uh, point of extending the fact that James was the, bro the, the book of James written by James was the brother of the Lord, the literal half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, one that came out of the same womb as Jesus came out of, the womb of Mary. And uh, he is not the Apostle James. I'm, I stress that, and the reason I stress that is because it's important for us to understand that this James, the brother of the Lord, who was not one of his early disciples, was never one of his apostles of the Lamb or anything like that, he was a man of God who watched Jesus growing up, his little brother. He saw Jesus, we don't know if he was two, three, four years old, but um, when, when James was born, he watched his big brother, and his big brother was different than all the other people. And uh, James had taken, you know, uh, provocation along with some of his family members, his brothers and sisters particularly, in regards to the fact that uh, Jesus wasn't all that he, they thought he was. Um, you know, he had been born and the stories were out that he was the Messiah, but after 30 years of living on the earth, even his own family members, including his mother, and I stressed this last week, even his own mother had her doubts, actually saw, thought sometimes that he was crazy and insane when he had forsaken his his position in the world and went on be, to begin to preach and teach uh, the, the word of God and, and cite the faith of people and do great and wonderful miracles that took place. But last week, if you didn't hear the program, I would encourage you to write in and ask for that program. We lay it out for you from the scriptures, not only from the tradition, not only from the history, but from the scriptures that this James was not the apostle James. He was not the uh, one of the sons of thunders with his brother John. He was not the, uh, the James, the son of Zebedee. He was, this was the brother of the Lord, and we emphasize several scriptures that referred to it. James was not an early follower of his own brother. It's important that we understand it. His perspective of Jesus was as a human being, as a big brother, and he loved, and, and there's no doubt that there was love in that family and affection for that family, but uh, James was not an early believer that Jesus was a or was the Messiah. I want to read this from John chapter 7. Uh, if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to you know, open it up and read it. Today we're so spoiled. We go to church, we don't even have to carry our Bible. We just go in there and they, they put something on the screen for us and we read the scripture that the pastor or the minister wants us to look at and, and that's great, fine, it's very helpful. There's no doubt about it for us to be able to see the scripture. But I found out in my own life that when I read, I open my own Bible and read my own Bible, when they say go to this scripture, go to this reference, that my eyes would fall upon maybe a verse before or a couple verses before or after and I see something new and a different truth, see something that I'd never seen before, even though I have read that scripture over and over and over again. I see something new, something fresh, something that becomes alive inside of my soul that takes me to another level or another step 
of walking with God in faith and in love. But here in John chapter 7, verse 1, it says, After these things, now Jesus is now in the midst of his ministry. He has handpicked his 12 apostles of the Lamb, which included James, John, and, uh, and Peter and the other ones. Uh, he had already picked them. Now he's in his ministry. But his own family did not believe in him. And so it says, After these things, which included, by the way, Jesus feeding 5,000 people, Jesus doing unbelievable miracles. It says here, that after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, which was his own home area, own hometown, uh, for he would not walk in Jewry or in Judea or in Jerusalem because the Jews sought to kill him. And it says in verse 2, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren, the word brethren here from the Greek, I pointed this out last week, means out of the same womb. Just as Jesus came out of the womb of the Virgin Mary, after that womb gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, she had several other sons and daughters. Uh, so his brethren, out of the same womb, therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that the disciples... Or that, that your disciples also may see the works that you do. For there is no man, they said, that doeth anything in, in, in secret, but he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And in verse 5 it says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. So his five brothers and his sisters, they, and even Mary at, by this time when Jesus entered into his, his uh, ministry as the Messiah to lead Israel and, and enlighten Israel, they did not believe in him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They actually thought that he was lifted up with pride. But this James, who was probably, I guess he was the oldest of all, the, uh, he was the second born of Mary, he did not believe. He was not one of Jesus's first or original disciples. And Jesus kind of rebuked him and said, your time is you know, always ready. And, and we, we see in the book of Acts chapter 1 that uh, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the death of Jesus, and Jesus was risen, risen from the dead, he sent the Holy Spirit and James and the bro his, his brothers, as, uh, uh, including Mary, the Virgin Mary, they were all there in the upper room. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And this James, the brother of the Lord, became a great leader of the church church in Jerusalem. Now, we know this, the historians, the traditionalists, they understand this chronologically, that this book of James that we're going to get into today, it was written in uh, AD 45 or 45 AD. Now, the apostle Paul was born again on the Damascus Road uh, in 37, so it was about seven years, yeah, about eight, seven, eight years before James wrote this letter. This particular letter by James was written at the time that Paul was now with Barnabas in the church of Antioch when God spoke to them and said, separate me, uh, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have called them to. And that's when they were appointed to be apostles. James early on had met the apostle Paul, heard his conversion experience in the, on the Damascus Road along with Peter. But G, uh, Paul, when he wrote about this, he said, you know, I, hadn't, I didn't see any of the other apostles. But James, he did see the brother of the Lord, he said, along with Peter. And so um, uh, the, the point I want to make here is it's very important for us to understand the view that this James had, the brother of the Lord had in his perspective. Again, he wasn't an early or first original disciple of Jesus. He came along after, but he had a life experience with Jesus. He saw his big brother growing up who was different than any other ordinary man. We know that Jesus was perfect in all of his ways, but yet there were still people that found fault in his perfection because they didn't, you know, they couldn't live it. They couldn't live by the law. They couldn't fulfill the law. And they gave up on that. But James has a view of Jesus growing up, how he talked, what was his character, what was his nature, what and how did he exercise his authority as a man on the earth. And James, again, he, he interpreted that or misinterpreted it for a season in his life. But eventually he, of course, came around and understood it. But let me read a couple other verses of scripture that I think are very important. And we referred to this here. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 54, it says, When Jesus taught the people, they were astonished. And they said, Is not this the carpenter's son? And is not his mother Mary? 
called Mary and his brethren, those out of his, uh, the same womb, James and Joseph and uh, Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not with us? So they saw Jesus in his humanity. They saw him as a natural human being, which he was 100% human, but also 100% God. They go on here in Mark chapter 3, we're told, and the multitude came together so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his family or his uh, when, when his family, his brethren, heard, they went out to lay hold on him to keep him in check, is what that literally means, for they said he is beside himself. And one translation says he was out of his mind or he was insane. So even, and even Mary, his own mother, when Jesus had forsaken everything, he had been a, grown up as a carpenter, the carpenter's son. He had worked for 30 years growing up. You know, yeah, he was an elitist. He was, he was tremendous in the synagogue. He preached mightily, uh, interpreted the scriptures, read the scriptures. He was different, though. But all of a sudden, he entered into his ministry at 30 years old. And for the next three and a half years, while he's there in that ministry, teaching, preaching, and working miracles, his own family did not believe him. They thought he was out of his mind. They thought he must be crazy to quit his job. How is he going to pay for his food? How is he going to eat? How is he going to sleep? Who's going to take care of him? You know, is he going to be a beggar? Is, you know, what? They, they had trouble understanding the decision he made, or really the will of God that was proclaimed for him to follow God's will. And so it goes on, and while everybody else, a whole crowd of people are sitting in the house, sitting at his feet, finally his mother and his brethren and his sisters come to the house. It says in verse 31 of Mark chapter 3, his brethren and his mother were outside. They were calling for him. And Jesus' response was, who is my mother or my brethren? And he said unto them that sat about him, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and sister and mother. The point here is Jesus was not relenting. There was no compromise. Even though he loved his mother and his brothers and sisters so much, they were not sitting at his feet. They were not doing the will of God in coming to hear the word of God. Again, how important it is for us to hear the word of God. This te television program and radio programs and all the ministers that come here, we do it with an incentive. We do it for your benefit, not our benefit. It's, it's not for us, it's for you. You need to hear the word of God. You need to open up your Bible. You need to pay attention to what the scriptures have said. You know, it, it was funny. I just was, pre I was preaching for Pastor Lawrence Pounds, I was telling you uh, about his church here, and uh, I, this past Sunday, and I was preparing for my sermon. And I saw a scripture, I was talking about the importance of asking God. James here writes, we'll see it later. He said, you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lust. Well, James understood this. He, he recognized the difference in his, his brother Jesus. But I'm, I'm looking and I'm preparing this message in regards to the importance of asking. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And I'm looking at these scriptures, preparing those scriptures, and I want to read this from 1 John. This is now the original apostle uh, of, of the Lamb, and he, this is the brother of James the apostle, the son of Zebedee, the two brothers, also called the sons of thunder. He is an old man now, and he writes this, and I want you to listen to this, and actually not only listen to it, check it out, because I have read these scriptures for 38 years. 39 years now, studied the Bible, read the Bible over and over and over again in different parts, uh, subjects and things of this nature, read this scripture, and I never saw this particular truth that I'm about to share with you here today. So I would encourage you, don't just believe what I say. Go over there and check it out yourself. It says here, John said here, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. And do those things which are pleasing in his sight. That's why God will answer our prayers, because we please him. Of course, without faith, it's impossible to please him, the Bible says. So we keep his commandments, and the commandments are not just the Ten Commandments. Obviously, everybody knows that the two most important commandments are to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your you know, mind, with everything that is within you, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, these two laws really encompass all the law of God. 
If you were to love God that way and love your neighbor as yourself, that you will fulfill the law. So again, he says, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And then verse 23, look at that if you would. Listen carefully. Check it out to see if I'm telling the truth. Again, I never saw this truth. I've never been enlightened until I was preparing to minister to this church that I was just telling you about. Verse 23, and this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Here is his commandment. I never saw this. I know about loving God and loving your neighbor, but he said, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on his name, the name of his son Jesus Christ. When you look at the Greek, and you may have been listening to this program enough times to hear me share the importance of the word name, that it's not just a matter of name it, claim it, or say it, or anything of that nature, but to name, to believe on the name of Jesus is to believe on the character of Jesus, to believe on the uh, nature of Jesus, and to believe on the authority of Jesus. The authority, the character, and the nature of Jesus. This is God's commandment for us, that we believe on that name. When we use that name, it's not frivolous, it's not uh, abracadabra or anything like that. We stop, we pause, and we say, God, I can't do this, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Father, in the name, in the authority, in the character, in the nature of Jesus, I proclaim this victory. I proclaim this pro promise. I proclaim this healing or whatever you're doing to minister to someone and bring in benefit to people. This is God's will, to believe on his name. It is an important thing for us to understand. Now, James, again, has a different perspective than most of the, all the 12 apostles of the Lamb. They believed in him, the ones that Jesus had handpicked. They followed him. They sat at his feet. They learned from him. They prayed and asked God, teach us to pray. And, and, and they had the inner insight, special insight to the ministry and the calling and the gifts of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for 30 years or somewhere about that, James and his brothers saw his older brother living. And he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. He was different. He lived the life. And James couldn't understand it. There were areas of his life that he just could not understand how Jesus could do this or do that. But later on, after his conversion, he himself is enlightened, and he became one of the chief leaders. Actually, he was even called one of the apostles, not an apostle of the Lamb, not one of the 12 original, but he became a called sent one by God and began to be the overseer of the church in Jerusalem and took a very, very important position. But again, he had to have it all reanalyzed. He had, to he had to be regenerated to understand the things that God was doing. So let's pick up reading here. James, the book of James, he wrote this about 45 AD. At the same time in the church of Antioch, Paul and Barnabas are being called and separated to be apostles themselves and sent. James has had a brief uh, interview with the, the Apostle Paul when he was a younger man after his conversion, but years have gone by, and James is still thinking like the original apostles, that the Word of God, the Messiah, was sent for the J Jewish people, for them. It was the Jewish Messiah. They didn't yet understand the concept of God going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, which we now know is the will of God, including to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 15, we see that Paul and Barnabas came back and gave the report of what God was doing, uh, you know, with the, with the Gentiles, as well as Peter came back and the uh, conversion of Cornelius' house had taken place. And so James, and we mentioned this last week, he said, my sentence and my decision is this, that we've got to accept these Gentiles into the kingdom of God as anybody else. But at the time, when Jesus was ministering, he told the, the, his, his apostles, go into just Israel. First preached the gospel, but first to the Jew, later on, and now we're later on, it's now for the Gentiles. But when James is writing this letter, he is thinking about the 12 tribes of Israel and supporting them. So he says in the ver very first verse, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he now was calling Jesus Christ his own Lord, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. 
So he was saying to all of you Jews, I'm writing to you, of all the 12 tribes of Israel, I'm writing to you and I want to greet you and I've got something important to say to you. Read this letter. Take time to analyze it and, and allow it to become life-giving inside of your heart and interpretation of what I have seen and have known from my big brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall, fall, into different temptations. The word temptations there can also be and should be translated trials and tests. Count it all joy when you fall into different temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, and then, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, in need of nothing, absolutely content where you're at. Now let's analyze this for a moment. Count it all joy. Listen to a couple other translations. It says, one translation says, let it be all joy to you. Another modern translation says, reckon it nothing but joy. Another translation says, my friends, be glad. Another translation, be very happy when you fall into different trials, tests, and temptations. And another one says, consider yourselves fortunate. Now, why in the world would James write that? The very first thought he had uh, 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 in regards to talking to Christians that were struggling with trials, tests, and temptations. He said, count it all joy, reckon it all joy, consider yourself fortunate. Why would he say that? Well, number one, he saw his big brother acting that way, living that way. This here, counting it all joy, is a reference to having faith in the midst of a trial, in the midst of a test, in the midst of a temptation, to rejoice in the Lord, to be glad, to be very happy, very happy. Leap for joy, Jesus said, when, you are, you know, you know, when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. There's no doubt. James had seen his big brother, Jesus, going through tribulations in his life. He had some hardships, some bad news that came this way and that way. And, uh, and uh, he was in this world. The trials were there. The devil was there. He, he, you know, he just didn't flee from, from, you know, from Jesus. The devil came and tempted him. 40 days and 40 nights just before he went in there uh, to start his ministry. He was tempted of the devil. And he was led by the Spirit to be in that place. And he was fasting and praying. But he was counting it all joy. He understood. How about the fact that Jesus on the cross, it says, on the cross, he saw the joy that was set before him. While he's suffering, bleeding, physically pained and, and brutalized, there he is the, for the joy that was sent before him. He endured the cross, the joy. This is a reference to an act of faith, of living by faith. This is one of the first things you need to understand as a Christian. The Apostle Paul said, that our James here says first, but let patience have her perfect work. It was actually preparing us for, uh, you know, for patience. When Paul spoke about his, his calling, he said, the number one sign of my calling was patience. Before signs and wonders and miracles, it was patience. He says that. So count it all joy. This is an act of your faith in the trial, in the test. Don't feel gloom. Don't give in to despair and depression. Don't murmur and complain. Stand up and begin to rejoice. Stand up and say, God, you're with me. You will deliver me. You will set me free. I believe I'm speaking to people right now watching this program that need to hear that. You are sitting on your sofa. You turned in this television program by accident or maybe YouTube or Facebook or some other um, uh, medium. And all of a sudden you're hearing this and you're in despair you're struggling and you need to understand how powerful it is for you to stand up and believe God, stand up in faith and begin to rejoice in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, he go, James goes on to say, for the trying or the testing of your faith. This is what's going on when you go through a trial, test, or temptation. Uh, it is the proving of your faith and patience. Again, one of the chief signs of an apostle. Then it goes on to say, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. The word liberally here means simply, openly, frankly, and sincerely in the original language or the Greek language. Let him ask 
If you lack, if you're lacking any wisdom, if you're uh, forsaking, literally forsaking, or if you're left off wisdom, you you know the Bible says God has made us, has given us the wisdom of God. But if you're not allowing it to express itself inside of you, you're not taking the time to really allow the Holy Spirit to direct you. Then He says, uh, "Ask of God, who gives to all men liberally." And he upbraideth not. He won't revile you. He won't reproach you. He won't scold you. But then he says here, but let him ask in faith. James understands and understood the message of faith, of believing in God. That's one of the great commandments. Again, going back to 1 John chapter 3, this is his commandment that we believe on the name of Jesus Christ. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What a statement right there. James is declaring right now, because he knew he was in that position. Let not that man think. When he did not believe in his brother Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus was having no compromise, no mercy on him. Either hear the word of God or you're not my brother, you're not my sister, you're not my mother, you're not my family members, the ones that listen. That's the will of God. And he is saying now, he's reinforcing that because he saw Jesus acting the same way. He says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his works. He goes on to say this, verse 9. Let the brother of low degree, or one that is humiliated, brother or sister in Christ that's really struggling, going through a hard time, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Again, another exhibition, a reality of faith, releasing of your faith. Let the one that's down and out, the brother and sister in Christ that's down and out, let them not think that they're going to receive anything in the Lord if they stay depressed, but rather stand up and declare who they are in Christ Jesus, that God is with them. He'll never leave them nor forsake them. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. And then he says in verse 10, but let the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, the flowers thereof fall, and the grace and the fashion of it perish. So shall also the rich man fade away in his ways. Here, here is James is talking about people that trust in their financial wealth, their bank accounts or whatever. We have got to learn the importance of standing up and having and relying on God himself. He is our helper. He's our maker. He's our creator. Now in closing, I just want to encourage you. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, minister to these people that are listening to this message, that they would live by faith, that they'd understand what it is to walk and live by faith and in the spirit. God wants you he needs you as well. You live by faith and God will use you in a great way. Till next week or next time, God bless you.